Welcome everyone. My name is Annette Johns and I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Practice with the Newfoundland and Labrador College of Social Workers. I have the honor of being the moderator for today's education event, Addressing Eating Disorder Behavior by Targeting Emotional Avoidance. We have 270 social workers from across Newfoundland and Labrador registered for this event this morning. This is Social Work Month and the theme, Social Work is Essential, highlights the important and essential role of social workers in enhancing the health and well-being of individuals, families, groups and communities across diverse fields of practice. It is also International Women's Day, so happy International Women's Day everyone. It is always so wonderful when we can come together to learn from our social work colleagues and enhance our knowledge in providing high quality social work services. Sessions that focus on a theory, therapeutic approach, or practice intervention always generates a great response. In previous CE evaluations, members suggested that working with clients with an eating disorder will be a great CE topic for a webinar, and I'm so pleased that this is the focus for our webinar this morning. Today's webinar is a collaboration between the Canadian Association of Social Workers and the Newfoundland and Labrador College of Social Workers. The webinar presentation will be approximately 75 to 80 minutes, followed by a 10 to 15 minute question and answer period that I will moderate. Please note that all the details you need, like how to access the slide deck and handouts and other housekeeping information is under the announcement and housekeeping widgets. And all the widgets can be accessed by clicking the blue and white icons at the bottom of your window. You can also resize and move around any of the elements you see on your screen to customize your viewing experience. During the presentation, I encourage you to type in your questions using the question mark icon at any time, and I will begin asking them at the end of the presentation. However, please note that only the presentation team can see the questions. I now want to introduce our speaker, Rick Parsons. Rick is a registered social worker who graduated from Memorial University with a Master of Social Work, Bachelor's Degrees in Social Work and Sociology, and a Certificate in Criminology. For the past 10 years, he has worked in the field of mental health. He has worked in community mental health, intensive case management, correctional institutions, and acute and residential treatment programs. Rick is currently a clinical social worker with the Eating Disorders Inpatient Program through Mental Health and Addictions at Eastern Health. He is trained in evidence-based therapy approaches for the treatment of persons with eating disorders, as well as their families. He is intensive, <clears throat> intensively trained in dialectical behavioral therapy through the Behavioral Tech and has completed advanced training in emotion-focused family therapy through the International Institute of EFFT. Rick is also a private practitioner <clears throat> and a member of the NLCSW Promotion of the Profession Committee. Rick, I'm really looking forward to your present presentation this morning and I will now turn the virtual podium over to you. Good morning, everybody. Happy Social Work Month and happy International Women's Day. To start off, I want to acknowledge that the detail and information that you'll receive in this presentation is based on emotion-focused family therapy principle and approaches from the work of Joanne, Dr. Joanne Dalahanty and Dr. Adele LaFrance. Both of these uh, PhD psychologists uh, are the co-developers of emotionally focused family therapy. The work you'll also see is based on the work of the Maudsley Hospital. Some learning points for today's session. We'll talk about the function of eating disorder behaviors, as well as emotional avoidance, emotionally focused family therapy and, of, and emotions. I'll give some practical skills for, for clinicians working with eating disorder patients, and also some practical skills for clinicians who are working with caregivers. The function of eating disorder behaviors. So what we know about restriction and restrictive eating patterns is that it physically, that people become physically less responsive to feel feelings. And this happens through the process of starvation. And it goes back to the, to the trials of the Minnesota starvation uh, experiment, which actually happened in the 1940s where people were um, tested and there was an experiment to determine that um, people were, it determined that people were less responsive to emotions. 
Binging soothes emotions, very much like emotional eating um, is what happens when people engage in binging, uh, binging food. Purging releases um, emotions in a very much, um, so when people purge, it, pur pur purge their food or vomit their food, it mimics the release of emotion. People, use these, people with eating disorders use these symptoms to cope instead of expressing their emotions. Some background in emotionally focused family therapy. It was developed as an adjunct therapy for adolescents with eating disorders. Doctors Dalhante and LaFrance, who were the co-developers of emotionally focused family therapy, they observed the effects of a clinician and the parent that fed the belief that the experts were the only one who could save the child. So what was found was that a lot of reliance was put on clinicians to save um, their, their loved ones with an eating disorder. And what Dr. LaFrance and Del Delhanti found was that in fact, we had to involve families um, and, and make other people um, competent in being able to provide the care and treatment for their own loved ones with an eating disorder while they also were receiving um, professional care through the treatment team. The history of an eating disorder intervention shows that the medical model really wasn't working. EFFT draws upon emotionally focused therapy, uh, motivational interviewing, the Maudsley family-based therapy, the new Maudsley method, as well as other behavioral therapies. And it's also rooted and there's some work being done through Gottman as well as um, in the attachment theory. And how we deliver emotionally focused family therapy are through caregiver workshops, as well as individual parent and family-based therapy sessions. EFFT also integrates really well with the ACT therapy, as well as DBT. So emotionally focused therapy um, started with, or was co-developed by, or developed, sorry, by Dr. Leslie Greenberg. And what Dr. Greenberg determined was that emotions are the boss of the brain, that there are, that emotions take a process and that we have to experience emotions to get to the other side. Emotions are the core of mental health. That symptoms are way that symptoms are the way of coping with painful emotions, and we certainly see this in eating disorder behaviors, where when people restrict, binge, and purge um, their food, it can be uh, it is a way of coping with really uncomfortable, difficult emotions, and it's and it comes through, out through the behavior. Emotional avoidance is at the root of a sim at the symptom. So at the core, eating disorders are about emotions. Emotional processing is the key of recovery. And you have to get to a place that we can feel it. You have to feel it to heal it. So I'm sure many of you are wondering, why are we focusing on emotions? So if, emotion, if an emotion is not followed through, then they can become feared and overwhelming. So emotions have to run their course. They need to be expressed and they need to be validated. Eating disorder symptoms are a way of avoiding emotions instead of expressing emotions. They can become too painful and the symptoms can then turn into distraction, avoidance, acting out, blowing up, restricting, over control or numbing and drowning. And these become more of the coping mechanisms that are seen. We can't take, we can't just take coping symptoms away without addressing the underlying emotion in some way. So in eating disorder treatment, there is a lot of emotional processing being um, happening with the client and, and the client being able to process their emotions in a therapeutic safe way.
why are we focusing on emotions in with eating disorders? So for an individual who has an eating disorder, restricting binging and purging are developed as ways to cope with avoidance. And as I've talked about a couple of slides ago, restriction numbs our emotional response. Binging soothes it soothes our emotional response and purging releases emotions or mimics the release of an emotion. And we know that self-efficacy, um, that patients with an eating disorder have low self-efficacy with emotion and emotion, uh, they are more emotionally avoidant, um, which can continue to contribute to the problem. So when we focus on emotions, if things are said with compassion, it can actually trigger the calming and compassionate part of the brain that sends a message to our hypothalamus, what we call the Grand Central Station, where we're able to actually calm ourselves down uh, and to create more or increase the flexibility. So avoiding emotions is hard work. We try not to feel, patients who have an eating disorder would try not to feel something, uh, try not to feel any emotion. If the emotions not follow through, the emotion, as I mentioned, becomes very feared and very overwhelming. And they use the symptoms to cope. We got to do so, they, they want to do something with the feelings. So it, they learn, patients with an eating disorder would learn um, by restricting, we may not feel, we become more or less responsive to emotions. Or if they engage, if the patient be, uh, is involved in the binging and purging cycle, then the patient becomes, um, uh, they, they sue, they're able to soothe that emotional discomfort and that overwhelming response to emotion by soothing their emotions from binging. And then releasing the emotions comes through purging. So some emotionally focused family therapy skills that we're going to talk about today is the emotion coaching. We're going to talk about uh, behavior coaching, which is done through providing meal support. I'm going to speak about caregiver blocks and uh, I'll talk a little bit about chair work, but we're not going to. That's more in of an, of an advanced uh, emotionally focused family therapy skill. And I will give uh, a highlight at the end of how you can get some training in that area if you're interested. I'll also sp speak about the therapeutic relationship repairs as well as the clinician blocks. So we ask caregivers to become their loved one's emotion coach, which is done through emotional processing. So we're, this would be learning the, motion, the emotion basics to learn how to validate emotions. Mm -hmm. The second step we ask caregivers to do is to become their loved one's behavior coach. And this is um, really applied during the meal support process. It's, it's done through the interruption of eating disorder symptoms. In adolescent family-based therapy, uh, parents would actually do the refeeding, but with adults, we allow the, we train uh, family members to be able to validate and, and act as a behavior coach so that the patient can uh, have more control of, uh, uh, gain some efficacy and, and be able to have more control and being able to eat uh, independently. Another skill that we ask caregivers or teach caregivers to do is supporting their loved ones to heal old wounds. So this would be if there is um, something that's happened in the relationship between a loved one with an eating disorder and a family member, which may actually be getting in the way of validating emotions or even being able to help in the meal support process. And what we teach family members to do is to go back and do a relationship repair. And that's where you, it, it can really help with that forgiveness in, in the relationship and have some benefits uh, to being able to work more closely together in a, in a more nurturing, caring way. We also have family members work through their own fears or their own emotional blocks. And if this isn't taken care of, 
um, or it isn't processed in a therapeutic way or an effective way, then it really can impact um, the emotion coaching and the behavior, the behavior coaching of the loved one. We also ask clinicians to do the same. So when clinicians are working with individuals with an eating disorder, um, it, we know that parent, you know, we're asking parents to do the really hard work, to be vulnerable, to push through their own work in order to service uh, their loved one who has an eating disorder. And this requires strong rapport and it requires the cl clinician's willingness to also do the same thing. So we ask clinicians to also act as a, an emotion coach to validate the caregiver's experience, to maybe even validate the patient who you're working with who has an eating disorder. If you're supporting a family member of a loved one who has an eating disorder, you may also, we, we would also ask the caregiver to uh, come into session and then we would, as a clinician or as a social worker, we would be helping do the behavior coaching in, in session with the client or with the family member and supporting the caregiver to heal old wounds. And that would be done again through relationship repairs or even processing caregiver blocks. I'm gonna talk specifically about these, uh, these skills. So this is the emotion coaching and behavior coaching skills. There are two steps. The first step is validating the emotion. So with validation, we're conveying the message, I see you, I understand you, or I accept you. It lets the loved one or the person know that what they're feeling, what they're experiencing is real and it acknowledges that you believe it's real and it's a true emotional experience that they have. So when someone is validated, we're actually giving them permission to feel this way. And as I mentioned, when we say things with compassion and we validate someone's emotions or experience, we're calming or trigger, we're triggering the calming or compassionate part of the brain which sends a message to the hypothalamus or the grand central station of the brain that allows them to calm themselves down and to increase flexibility. So when someone's validated, again, we're giving them permission to feel that way. And we're, by attending to an emotion, you communicate caring and you see the benefits in the forms of maybe the reducing an emotional arousal. So we see people's emotion be able to decrease or their emotions able to be processed. So if someone's angry, for example, you may see that anger subside. Or if someone's fearful, we may see that fear subside. It also, validation also increases trust and it improves the connection between people. It also improves the patient's ability to self-validate. The second step of emotion coaching is providing support. And this is done through emotional support or through practical support. And I'm going to get a little bit more detailed in uh, with this as well. So the first step, so recognizing there are only two steps. First step, validating the emotion. We're acknowledging the emotion or the desire and providing three reasons why that makes sense. And we use, so the, so the trick and the tool with validating the emotion from an emotion-focused family therapy perspective or an emotion-focused therapy perspective is providing three reasons why you might think um, or be able to relate to their emotional experience. So we know that big emotions are, are accompanied by high internal activation. So that ends, people who experience high emotional responses may have a, hearsing, a racing heart, or they may experience breathing changes or tense muscles. And as a result, their thinking starts to shut down. So when we validate, our limbic system becomes calm and allows our prefrontal cortex to think. Validation. Um, is, a, is a reaction that's caused by big emotional spike and, 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 and it can help settle down those high uh, emotions quickly by validating. So we provide three because statements. I understand that you might feel 
And I'm going to give the example of validating fear for, for somebody who has an eating disorder. I understand that you might feel afraid of eating pasta because you have not had pasta in a really long time and because you find it hard to eat pasta and because your eating disorder makes you think that you're going to gain weight. The reason we provide three because statements is because generally the patient doesn't hear the first one. The second one, they may, it may actually um, trigger their response to think they hear it. Maybe they actually get it. And the third one is, ah, they get it. They understand. So at validating emotions, we're changing the but statements to because. And this gives the message that um, what they're feeling or experiencing, it, it gives the permission. So but would erase anything said before it, whereas because is more of a joining statement where we're actually able to say they get it, they understand it. These are three reasons why uh, why I might be feeling this way or they, they're, they're even attempting to understand. So it, you'll notice in the handouts that are provided, there is a script there. And in the script, it'll be helpful to review and use with patients or even family members. And you'll notice in that script or that handout that's attached, there are some statements there. Uh, and we also use these in emo when we're validating emotions. No wonder you feel that way because, and these are some opening statements. Of course you feel that way because, or I understand you feel that way because. What we're doing here is we're avoiding going for the bright side. We're not really trying to find logic or we're not trying to correct the loved one's version of reality because you've got, you got to feel it to heal it. So imagine you're in a deep hole. Your first instinct is to, is to reach someone's in a, your, your loved one or someone with an eating disorder is in a, a deep hole and you as a clinician or even as a parent, your first instinct is to reach in and pull your loved one out. You want to tell them that's fine. Just grab a ladder and climb out. It's easy. Just eat the food. You'll get better. But instead, we want to get down in the hole with them and try to understand their point of view. Now that I'm down in this hole, seeing what you're seeing, I understand why climbing out feels so hard. I understand why eating feels so hard because it's muddy and it's slippery and the surface seems so far away because you've been fighting to get out for so long and your muscles are tired and because you feel fat because food in your belly doesn't feel good right now. So imagine another example. Your loved one says, everyone at work hates me. I'm such a loser. Notice what instinct, what your instinct is. It's probably to say you're not a loser. However, what actually does leave the loved one, it leaves the loved one alone and feeling, um, feeling shut off. And this can actually be a pro help with the process of being cut off and not feeling comfortable and safe with being able to process emotions further when we're, when we're, um, when we're, when somebody is coming back with more logic or correcting our sense of reality. We're not able, we're unable to show or view this uh, video on the webinar system. It is a very short video and I encourage you all to view it later and use it with families or even use it with patients with an eating disorder. It is Brené Brown, um, the difference between empathy and sympathy. Uh, it's a very powerful video in showing how validation is, is uh, very important. Providing support. So with providing support, there is emotional support. So there's two, so this is the second step of emotion coaching. So the first step was validating the emotion. The second step is providing support. There are two arms, A or B, if you will. A is providing support. Different emotions have different needs. So what we know about sadness is that people want to feel comforted. That's the underlying need of sadness, is to feel comforted. The underlying need for anxiety and fear is to give somebody reassurance. 
and perhaps with a gentle push. The underlying need for anger is validation and boundaries. So validating the anger and then also setting effective and healthy boundaries. And then the, the emotional need of joy is to share, to share, um, to share people, to share our joy with people, to share what we're excited about. The practical support piece, which is the B part of providing support. This is um, from healing with an eating disorder. Support would mean providing meal support. So it might mean proceeding with the plan. Uh, and then the second piece would be around symptom interruption. So interrupting the symptoms, whether that be binging and purging or whether it be over exercise, whether it be using laxatives or diuretics. Um, and we do that, we teach families and clinicians to do this by uh, distracting, by uh, redirecting, by teaching them skills or even offering solutions. So if somebody is having meal in, in uh, having difficulty with a meal, we would use the three because statements to validate the emotions. And we would provide the emotional support to have a dialogue and a conversation and ensure that we're meeting the needs of that emotional, that they're, the emotion they're experiencing. And then the practical support might be, we're going to still proceed with the plan. Let's pick up your fork and continue to eat. Or it might be, I see you're struggling, or I know you've struggled during that meal. Let's play a game together. So that's the practical support piece around symptom interruption. So when it comes to supporting your loved one through, uh, or a loved one through meal support, the big emotion is often anxiety about eating. So we need to be able to validate why they would feel anxious about eating with the three because statements, and then provide a gentle but firm push uh, to do the thing that they fear, which be, let's proceed with the plan, let's continue eating. The practical support around behavior coaching, we're gonna to touch on shortly. So the foundation of the work, so the foundation of emotionally focused therapy skills, as well as working with loved ones and family members who have an eating disorder. So we know that emotion, that, it, that mental health issues have a huge impact on families and that caregivers alone do not cause mental health issues, that the causes are much more complex and that avoidant, emotion avoidant dynamics are believed to contribute to and to feed the mental health issues. But more importantly, they're also the way out. So by, actually, by going towards emotions, they are the way out of um, engaging or, or rec the way through recovery from an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So by including families um, were, who, who typically have been shut out from eating disorder um, work or eating disorder treatment because historically outside of you know the last 15 plus years families felt that clinicians had to do all the work they um, were uneasy about doing the work they were kind of shut being families were shut out and what we know is by including families um, they, they also have more of an idea now of what's happening behind the scene because we know more about eating disorders and we know more about the role that emotions play in eating disorder treatment. So by building confidence um, and, and self-efficacy with family members and with patients, we're actually teaching them to be able to handle difficult and painful emotions. And we do this through advanced caregiving which are the skills that you're learning here today. They're also skills that parents typically don't have. So in the area of eating disorders, a big role of the social worker is to provide these skills to families so the family can become an integral part of treatment. How do mental health issues develop? And this is within the context of an eating disorder. So caregivers often blame themselves or feel blamed by clinicians or by professionals. So by normalizing and de-blaming, um, this is a, an important part. And we believe by asking parents to be more involved um, helps them to decrease their blame, which can be an often block, uh, an, an emotion block of why families don't get involved. Caregivers do not cause mental health issues. And like I mentioned, they're far more complex. 
So let's look at the bubbles. Um, and all of these bubbles play different components into how mental health symptoms are manifested. We know with a patient with an eating disorder, we cannot change genes. That's at the 12 o'clock, top of the clock there, or the top bubble. We change this, uh, we cannot change this. Sometimes it's genetic makeup. So it is genetic makeup. We're unable to change genes of anybody with an eating disorder or any of our own genes. The temperament is what we call the super feeler. And this highlights or really replaces the old word of sensitive. So you're too sensitive. So when we look at in the area of eating disorders or emotionally focused family therapy, we use the word of super feeler. And this is when emotions are more, are, are more intense. And it's when we do, put up the dial of emotion. So the volume on the dial gets turned up. And then they, patients with an eating disorder would use uh, avoidance or their symptoms to cope. There are biological factors that when they're upset, it might take them longer to uh, return to a baseline or to calm down. And that babies are born more emotionally sensitive. So that might be the super feeler. That's the explanation of what the super feeler is. Epigenetics you see there as well is this is when experiences uh, in our genetic makeup get passed down from generation to generation. We don't have any control of this. Social and cultural factors. This is the media influence of like the dieting culture, Weight Watchers commercials, Instagram, Facebook, billboards, TikTok, all of these social media platforms. We don't have control of those social and, and cultural factors. The life stressors. We also don't have control of those. They can't change. They're a normal part of life. Life stress happens um, and it's a normal part of, of, of life. Puberty. Uh, so puberty has been linked to the development of an eating disorder. And we can't change that internal bodily system from uh, when it decides that it's going to hit puberty or doesn't. Uh, that, that, that isn't, that's unchangeable. What we can change with family members as social workers when we're working with them, or even for loved ones who have an eating disorder, is the family environment. And the family environment is learning to let emotions be there learning, teaching families to be able to be comfortable with processing and working through painful or difficult conversations or emotions. We can also change emotional processing, which you see there as well. And this is a learning to let emotions be felt and be present. So we do this through advanced caregiving, which is this, this tools that I'm, uh, that I'm, the skills that I'm teaching you here today or sharing with you here today. Why do we target caregivers? So you'll notice I'm putting a big focus on caregivers as well as with family or patients who have an eating disorder. And I'm using that words kind of simultaneously moving back and forth because the skills can apply to both. Why are we looking at caregivers? So we believe that caregivers will do anything they can to help their child and that uh, they can learn to support their loved one through symptom interruption. Uh, so there really is no better individual to, that's better equipped to take an active role in caring for their loved one. Uh, and this could be a parent, a sibling, a partner, a friend, someone who loves them unconditionally and wants to support them. And we know that involving families actually increase the success rates with, emo with being able to process emotions and work its way uh, through eating disorder behaviors and decrease eating disorder behaviors that involving family members uh, increases the success rate astronomically. They can be a big help to interrupting the symptoms of an eating disorder and getting back on track with development or life. It can also, families can also help with the behavior of an eating disorder by interrupting the cycle of emotional avoidance and interrupting the binge purge cycle, for example, uh, by even also healing old wounds. Um, and then the patient would hopefully need, not need any more symptoms to cope. While we know that prof healthcare professionals have the expertise, we know that caregivers have the relationship. So if we teach caregivers to effectively respond and intervene with, a, with their loved one in addressing emotions and symptoms, they have extraordinary healing powers. The role of the caregiver, so I spoke about uh, parts of this already, that it's, there is an increase in the success rate. 
and that, it, that it's helping the loved one to become back on track with their life. In addition, so this is the caregivers acting as an agent of healing. In addition to providing information, the caregiver is active in leading or co-leading behavioral and emotion focused interventions in session, at home, by telephone, text, or email in the service of reducing behavioral symptoms and increasing self-efficacy with emotions. So what we're saying here is that sometimes we hear from families in the area of eating disorders that if they don't live in the same province or their loved one doesn't live with them or they don't live together so if they're friends and they're supporting their friend with an eating disorder that they can't really provide the support that's incorrect you can do it through text you can do it through email we can get very creative with our means of technology in providing uh, support to someone with an eating disorder and being able to validate emotions So what we know here is that when somebody experiences a painful emotion, if we target it with emotional support and validation, there's confidence built with family members, with someone's own ability, if they have an eating disorder themselves, with their own ability to use skills to manage the emotion and the stressful situation. And that can result in not needing the maladaptive coping behaviors any further, not needing the eating disorders, any uh, behaviors to, to work through emotions. And this can be uh, effective in building someone's self-efficacy with working through and processing emotions. I'm gonna specifically talk about two emotions here that, that we know are very difficult for many of the patients that we work with in the area of eating disorders. And those emotions are anger and the uh, behavior of silence. So what we know about anger is very much going back to the anger iceberg, that underneath the iceberg, we, uh, we know there are more vulnerable or uncomfortable feelings that are difficult sometimes to express. So this could be humiliation, it could be sadness, guilt, fear, hurt. And then above that, it's coming out through, through anger. It's coming out through um, expressing anger because the other emotions are difficult to process or difficult to feel, to, 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 to feel or experience. So below that surface of anger, uh, there might be strong emotions that need attention and those emotions are being shut down. So anger, it would be safe to say at times that anger is a primary emotion. And there are also times where anger is a secondary emotion that's used to cover up more deeper uh, emotions that are painful to bear which are the emotions that you would see there on the, uh, on the bottom of the iceberg. Anger is an emotion that gives us more power and control and also prevents or blocks us from allowing vulnerability. So with anger, we need to let the air out of the balloon. And we do this through emotion coaching by building the connection. We also use the same formula and we, but we need to approach the other person's volume, tone, and energy. And this will calm down the brain, leading to more flexibility. So with validating anger and taking the emotion coaching skills of, of validation, so the three because statements is what I'm referring to here, it's matching the volume, the tone, and the energy. So if somebody is uh, so if someone's screaming, we're not going to scream back. But if somebody is giving an assertive tone of, I don't want to eat that food, then we're going to be able to match that back with them, match and reflect that tone and energy back. I'd understand that you don't want to eat that food because it's difficult to eat that and you haven't ate it in a really long time and you don't like pasta or your eating disorder tells you not to eat it. So you're matching that tone back. You're, you're being able to use the same volume and the same energy. If you're sitting, you're probably going to get on the, the edge of your chair. Being able to really validate and feel and experience the anger without being um, higher in volume, because that would not be effective, or you're not going to scream if they're screaming back. So you're staying with the anger. 
So again, it's the three because statements. And we're going to match the tone and the volume, which is what we refer to as mirroring, staying with it even if they dismiss it. So if somebody says to you, uh, if someone, if we have a patient maybe who is angry because a friend canceled plans on them, you might say, I don't blame you for being angry. And that's a really good phrase to start off validation of anger, not using a low tone. You know, I don't blame you for being angry. And if they say, no, I'm not angry about that. Uh, I'm not angry because they canceled plans. Then I encourage you to stay with the anger, even if they dismiss it, because the uncomfortable emotions underneath that iceberg might be really difficult to feel and experience, and be be very feeling very um, unbearable for the for the patient. So you may go back and say, "No, you're really angry that they canceled on you. You're mad about this." There might be times where they still try to dismiss it. I would encourage you to stay with it. Um, but not push it to the place where they're going to get angry with you. It's not uncommon for a loved one with an eating disorder to push down anger, just like any other emotion. So if your loved one says, um, you know, I'm not mad, but you suspect they are, then you really try to validate uh, that you could see why they would be mad. Validating silence. So with silence, um, this can be really anxiety provoking. I mean, I'm sure everybody has gotten the silence treat the silent treatment uh, some at some time in their life. And this it can really bring up a lot of anxiety when people aren't talking, people aren't giving you anything. So when a loved one's silent and they're not saying anything with someone with an eating disorder or someone, a family member, we start to make guesses rather than asking questions. So it's important not to ask questions. You start to uh, make guesses. So if you're going to be wrong and you're afraid of being wrong, don't be concerned about it because you're, the people who you're doing it with will actually tell you what, that you're wrong. Usually they will open up and say, no, you're wrong about that. So we make space for the silence, which actually conveys an understanding and respect. And this goes a long way in maintaining that connection and really encouraging the loved one to eventually open up. So a common phrase to use with validating silence might be, I'm going out on a limb here. I'm wondering if, or I can imagine you're feeling something very difficult right now. So we start to take guesses. We don't say, um, are you angry with something I said at the dinner table? Or are you angry because I served you um, toast for breakfast? So you wouldn't really start guessing, but you would phrase it to start off with, I'm going out on a limb here. I'm wondering if it's something that I said at the dinner table. Are you upset about that? And sometimes they will come back and correct, no, it's not that reason, it's and give you another explanation. So with validating silence there, maybe some experience where sharing with you in the past or share the fa where they've shared with the family member in the past may not have been helpful. Um, so they actually don't want to go there. So while we're working with families or patients with an eating disorder or supporting families in that process, um, it's important to, to look at the history and maybe recognizing where they may have shared in the past has not been helpful. Or even as a clinician, maybe you've been unable to validate in the past or you haven't been provided enough validation. So sharing with you is also difficult. So that might be an opportunity to say, I can imagine you're feeling something difficult right now. I'm going out on a limb and I'm wondering if um, maybe when I did said this to you the last time, it what you didn't really receive it well and being able to uh, validate that silence there. So we first validate the silence, the fact that they're shut down, and then we validate the reasons, um, the various underlying emotions. So we choose an emotion. I'm thinking that, you know, I'm, go I'm wondering if you're upset or you're um, sad about and being able to validate the emotion. And then at the end, we're gonna meet the need. I can just imagine what you need is space, or I can imagine you need some time, and I'm going to go in the living room right now, and, and you can come out when you're ready, and I'll still be available to talk. Or I imagine what you need is no pressure, or for me to be there no matter what. So this is uh, for us as, as social workers, but also uh, for helping family members. 
So why are we focusing on emotions at mealtime? So the nature and function of food rituals uh, is about controlling and distracting away from emotions. So EFFT research shows that confidence is built with, built with families um, if we can better per, if we can provide meal support by teaching us to teaching family members to focus on emotions. So the nature and function of food rituals might be thoughts about eating disorder. It could be the patient having thoughts of what they ate yesterday. It could be thoughts about what they're going to eat. It could be counting calories in their mind. This can be very distracting. So we're going to focus on the emotions um, and then provide the practical support so that hopefully we're able to distract them away from the thoughts. The loved one needs help with interrupting the rituals. So interrupting the numbing cycle of food restriction or any emotions that might surface. And then the value of mindful connected eating is to allow emotions to be there and to be acknowledged and to be validated. At the core, eating disorders are about emotions, not food. Sometimes it comes out through the control of food, but it's generally a way of avoiding emotions or emotional experiences because it's painful, uncomfortable, or unbearable for them to feel or experience the emotion. So we behavior coach through meal support. We teach family members to do this. Um, we ask caregivers to take on the role of the emotion coach and the behavior coach, much like a clinician would do in an eating disorder treatment program uh, during mealtime. So in order, and this is done through interrupting the symptoms and, and supporting their recovery. And the role is to, uh, so we know that weight restoration and establishing a normal eating pattern are the first steps to recovering from an eating disorder. And doing that pro for, by providing support, which can lower the anxiety and also make eating a, a more uh, healthier, easier choice for the patient. The role of a coach so with family members particularly, is supporting the role of, as food as medicine, providing distraction during and post meals. So during our meal supports in the eating sort of programming, uh, there will be lots of conversation. It might be around the weather. It might be around a movie, a TV show. Uh, it could be about um, experiences, you know, of vacations that may have been positive. It could be any, any distraction conversation, uh, very much like a social um, conversation that you may have at home in, at your own table. And then post meals, distraction is generally done through uh, playing a game, reading a book, doing a crossword puzzle, uh, things like that. The, the other role of an emotion coach or behavior coach um, so, yeah, behavior coach is monitoring and interrupting symptoms. So the symptoms of wanting to hide food, of purging after meals or exercising. So in eating disorder programming, the patient has 30 minutes to eat the meal, um, lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then they have a 30 minutes post period. So during that post period would be the distraction and, the and, and monitoring the interruption of symptoms by staying at the table for that 30 minute period. And that's to help with the uh, interrupting symptoms of exercise, uh, hiding the food and the purging. And the other role of emotion of a behavior coach is providing support and validating and love and really providing and, and giving that message and that connection, uh, but the message of I'll never give up or I'm never and, and not giving up. I'm not going to go through all of these. It's a busy slide. I just wanted to give you uh, some ideas of some coaching phrases. So we would use, um, we would provide validation rather than reassurance or cheerleading. So instead of saying, I can see your anxiety, uh, I, I can see you're anxious and don't feel okay right now, uh, would be a more positive way of saying, um, of, of, of validating. I can see you're anxious and don't feel okay right now versus saying, don't worry, it's okay. So you can see how that's more dismissive of the emotion. We also say it's hard work and I hear that it's feeling impossible right now versus you can do it. So we really wouldn't provide that reassurance and cheerleading because it isn't as effective. We're not really looking uh, in that way. Of, we're not um, providing the validation of the emotional experience. So in validating emotions, we want to be able to pull out any emotion we can and to validate the emotion. And most importantly, 
um, to re be able to label and identify an emotion. So give it a feeling or emotion name. Providing matter of fact statements about what's happening and what will happen. That is your eating disorder speaking to you. We may also say, this is the fuel your body needs so you'll finish the meal. Or you're dropping food on the floor so I'll be adding a bit more to your plate to account for that. We want to provide uh, or to praise effort rather than achievement. I know how difficult this is for you. I know how difficult it is to finish your meal. And I really appreciate how hard you're trying. Or you've been brave today for sticking with this snack. Emotion blocks. So this is specific to caregivers. With emotion blocks, uh, there are animal models with our, which are um, co-developed by um, Dr. Adela France and Dr. Joanne Delahante, who are the co-developers of Emotional Focus Family Therapy. They develop um, animal models and, and attached models to help caregivers be able to figure out and relate to a particular animal to understand their, um, their, their own parent, to help caregivers understand their own styles. Mental health issues and your own emotions might be related to our past emotions and our past emotional experiences, um, which can actually um, inherently maintain the problem or inadvertently maintain the problem. Um, so this this would be sometimes if we um, are, are if if we have a family member who doesn't acknowledge emotions and sticks their head in the sand, so to speak, then that could keep the problem going. It could keep patients um, and their loved ones from being able to feel and experience emotions because they haven't seen it in their home. And we, we can end up changing the way we respond to an emotion and the way that we provide care. And we can do this by recognizing our own patterns or helping families recognize our own pa their patterns. Dr. Janet Treasure was also one of the people who um, created the animal models and then it was adapted and adopted from um, the co-developers of EFFT. So the mo these are the animals for the types of, of understanding the types of emotional responses. So it's the jellyfish. The jellyfish is um, the animal which usually wears their emotions on the sleeve. It's, it's people can see the emotion and there's no poker face. The ostrich is um, the opposite of the jellyfish. They're more solution focused. They're not comfortable with emotions. And as I mentioned, they dig their kind of head, tuck their head in the sand and, and, and uh, act as if there's no emotions uh, present. And the goal or correct balance of an emotional response is the warmth and the calmness that's created through the St. Bernard. And this is the animal where they go towards the crisis but they're also calm when they get there. They're providing the correct balance of support and um, and, and, and care and, 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 and support and care. These are three animals that are helpful in understanding, uh, helping family members understand their caregiving style. The kangaroo, so the kangaroo is the overprotective animal who um, tucks the tucks their loved one in their pouch so that they don't have to feel or experience. So they're more protective, uh, protecting them from anything they can. The rhinoceros is more of the controlling animal. You may hear statements from the rhinoceros such as, this is what you signed up for. They're more fact-based and they're always giving advice. So they're, they're, they're more argumentative and they push for change and growth without acknowledging or validating emotions. And then the correct balance that we're looking for here is the, it's done for the dolphin. The dolphin is um, there in the water, they're not picking you up, they're swimming with you and they're given gentle nudges. The fam they'd be a family member given those gentle nudges when, the, when their loved one needs it. So in, in also understanding blocks that families may experience when they're providing support 
emotional support to someone with a loved one. So it's not only understand the emotional responses and the caregiving responses through the animal styles, it's also looking at this diagram you see here. And what you see underneath the tree or underneath the soil is when you feel these emotions down here, you often do what's above the tree. So for example, when you feel fear, you start to avoid. When you feel helpless, you start to accommodate. When you feel self-blame, you may start to blame others or you might get defensive. So you see how what's below the soil are the feelings and what's above the soil are more of the behaviors. And we help, we use this to help family members really understand how their own experiences can get in the way and how they respond to their own loved one. And they're usually rooted in, you know, the behaviors of accommodating, the behaviors of denying or avoiding or rejecting. So what we practice from as in the area of so uh, of the area of eating disorders is knowing that uh, helping families understand those parent blocks, but also uh, helping parents that need support to release themselves from the shackles of those blocks. So we know that parent blocks are at the foundation of it all, um, and we and, and being able to understand help family members understand how their own behaviors. Um, is, is more so rooted in their emotional avoidance or the emotions that get unbear unbearable or uncomfortable. And that can impact how they uh, provide support to their loved one, whether it's emotional support or behavioral support. So, so blocks are addressed. It is a very critical component of the work as an emotion coach because you can't teach families to do emotion coaching without acknowledging what would get in the way. What are their own blocks? So being able to know what's the Achilles heel. What, is, uh, what are the fears and obstacles that are in the way? And it is very normal for people to have those, especially in the area of eating disorders where there's a fear of their loved one being medically unwell or being medically unstable or even, um, even dying. So when that's happening with, when you have parents who are, or caregivers who are having those fears, we want to really validate and acknowledge what those fears are. They are very normal. And if they're left unprocessed, the fears and obstacles will really start to interfere with how effective they can be. And blocks are addressed in many different ways from an emotion-focused family therapy uh, from the model. And it's done through the, the animal models and the emotion model that I've shared with you already. It's done through emotion coaching, which you've also um, I've also taken you through. It's also done through chair work, which is more advanced skill, which you will not learn here today. And it's they're also uh, it's blocks are also work through from therapeutic relationship repairs, which I'm going to take you through that now shortly. Blocks are addressed because they're a system of cascading attunement. Uh, clinicians must be attuned and responsive to the emotional needs of the parent. By feeling heard and understood, the parent becomes more capable of becoming attuned and responsive to their the loved one's recovery. And when we look for blocks, the um, we look for we look for blocks when the caregiver is having trouble with showing empathy. So if they can't, if they're having trouble, if they're getting feeling burnt out with their loved one, they're tired, they're like, I just want them to eat, then it might that block might be present. Or if they're having difficulty setting limits. It might be effective then to incorporate the blocks and being able to process some of that. Even acknowledging what the emotional block is for them, it can be effective in itself from changing and shaping their own behavior because they've built some awareness in what their block is. It's helpful to help family members know what's feeding the animal. Uh, she'll reject me and I can't bear to lose her or I'm afraid that uh, I will break down or explode in anger or do something that I'll regret. I can't afford to put strain on the couple relationships. This is a common one for people who um, are in uh, dual family situations. So if you have two parents, I can't afford to put strain on the couple relationship or alienate the other children that might even need me. So you have multiple children in the home. 
Um, or it might be their own resentment. Uh, she's done enough damage to our family. How long will it go on? So you know then that it is uh, very much rooted in um, them having trouble, trouble, the family member having trouble showing uh, empathy. The relationship repair. So this is the steps when there may, you may have a family member who um, is blaming themselves or a loved one uh, with an eating disorder who's also blaming themselves. So it's important for you, for us to teach family members to do a relationship repair uh, if the loved one blames themselves uh, or if, um, if anybody, if they're blaming somebody else or even if they resist the support. So if the family member is resistant to support, there might be uh, some value in going back to decrease the self-blame or being able to, um, to, to, to validate or share some of the um, things that a family member feels that could have gotten in the way or, or, or become um, you know, a block from being able to provide support. Because self-blame and shame are usually cr crippling and can often prevent recovery from even moving forward. Another time where we would do a relationship, recommend a relationship repair um, from a caregiver to a family member, or also could be from, from us as social workers to a family member or to a loved one or to, or to a patient sorry, with an eating disorder. It might also be if, the lo if, the, if they bl you blame yourself for something you've done. So the purpose of a relationship repair is to take the emotional burden off the loved one, to create a cleaner slate in terms of relationships, um, which generally or historically might have been a difficult relationship, so that the loved one can uh, have be able to accept support. So there's value in acknowledging and apologizing for something that happened in the past. People can be blaming themselves for something that happened. People with eating disorders often blame themselves. It's very common for a patient with an eating disorder to take on a lot of blame for other issues that happen in the family or for having an eating disorder and not knowing how to work their way through it. They may blame themselves for that. Um, or even caregivers may blame themselves for something that's happened or their own responses towards their loved one. So it is a gift to share the burden together and eventually uh, he or she will see that it's simply a collision of crappy events as opposed to one specific event. So it includes, this includes when a loved one is holding resentment from the past or when the relationship with the caregiver is strained. So it could be valuable to do the relationship repair there. What we tell family members, and this is very important, is not to rush out. Same with clinicians, if there's a repair in the relationship and we're using this tool, because it, even though it's specific to EFFT, which is has been designed primarily for the treatment of eating disorders, these skills can be used in other mental health contexts. So as social workers, we still would not recommend, or it's not recommended from an EFFT perspective to run off. It has to really be thought, tr thought through. So really thinking it through of how you're going to use the relationship repair. And we tell family members the same, not to rush off and, and do it. The outcomes of the relationship repair, it relieves the child or the adult child of a self burden, which helps to build confidence. It can relieve the parent of maladaptive self blame. It, repair, it can repair the relationship and heal any old wounds. It's the ultimate opposite of emotion avoidance, which is the key in a family based recovery. Uh, it decreases the resistance to parental involvement. So, you know, if, you, if, if somebody does receive resistance to an apology, it can be help, helpful to gently acknowledge that there will be no resistance about apologizing for something uh, if it wasn't something that the parent was feeling guilty about. So the, 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 somebody may, the child or the adult child or the loved one with an eating disorder may not receive the apology. Um, there might be some resistance but there really wouldn't be a need for the apology if the family member didn't feel that some guilt about something. So it can still be therapeutic for the family member so you can shape and change the behavior for the, from them going forward. 
so changing and so changing their support. There are four plus one ingredients to a relationship repair. So these are the steps. It's acknowledging the unique impact of the injury or the animal style or an, of the animal model. And this can be, um, you no, know, uh, sorry, it can be, we want to acknowledge the unique impact of the injury or what the animal model is. So going back to the animal models of emotional responses or caregiving responses that may have contributed to the style of emotional avoidance. We, the second step is expressing appreciation for what it must have been like. That's where we label and identify. We coach um, either ourselves, we, we do it ourselves or we help family members. We coach them in validating uh, and labeling um, the emotional experience. So what it must have felt like. It must, um, it, 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 it must have felt that I was abandoning you, for example. It, step three is apologizing and communicating the non-differential remorse. And what the non-differential remorse is, is it's, it might be saying, it's not that I have felt this way, it's that you have felt this way. So being able to say, um, being able to say, it must have felt like this for you. State what could have been done instead of what will change. So it's not that it, it or, or I wish I could have given you an, more of an opportunity to struggle. I'm learning about the eating disorder now and we're going to start there. And then, then the step five is waiting for the blast, the denial of silence and validating the reaction and then repeating steps two to four. So if you get a, if you get silence, then you go back and repeat steps two to four. Or if you get um, a blast or denial, you do the same. So some examples that uh, we've seen, I've seen with family members in the eating disorder uh, area might be apologizing for, uh, I've seen um, caregivers apologize to family members um, of their, so siblings of the law, of the person with the eating disorder for being not as available, not as supportive because they've been more preoccupied with the care and treatment of their loved one with an eating disorder. It might be where parents do an apology for perhaps having cancer in the past and missing a child's ballet recital, um, or not being home, um, as often because of their work. Um, so that might be something that they've apologized for. Or I, as I've mentioned in one of the examples, I didn't give you an opportunity to feel those difficult emotions because of their own, because of my own avoidance with them. The simplified steps, so this is just making it more simplified for you, is step one, say what you're apologizing for. Step two, say what it must have been like for them or saying you're sorry. Step four, saying what you would have done differently and what you'll do different from now on. And then validate the reaction. So validating the denial, the blast or the silence. And then you repeat steps two to four. So some example of apology steps. So I'm going to take this, the uh, four steps here um, and, and give this example. When we divorced, it was really hard for everyone, especially for you. I can understand, understand why you didn't share with us how you were feeling. It must have seemed like I couldn't handle it because I was in a lot of pain myself. And then with step two, we are saying what it must have been like for them. I can imagine how hard it must have been for you to see us like that. You must have also felt very angry that we didn't find a way to sort out our problems and sad knowing that you would never, that it would never be the same. I don't blame you for having felt this way. You were just a child and I, and it must have been really hard for you to cope with all of this on your own. Step three is saying you're sorry. I'm very, I'm so very sorry that you had to go through this. It pains me to think about how you've suffered as a result. And then step four, saying what you could have done, what you should have done differently. I should have found a way to protect you from what happened next. I should have just, I should have seen just how hard it was for you and given you the support you needed. So that's just one example. It's not specific to eating disorder. I wanted to make it a, that one more generic so you can see how uh, this can be applied outside of the area of eating disorders as well. 
There's some other examples there that you'll see. I'm not going to go through those in the interest of time. I have some resources. So there are some training opportunities um, through the Eating Disorder Foundation, who does uh, various support groups for individuals with an eating disorder. They do support groups for um, more specifically for caregivers and for siblings. They also specifically uh, teach the emotion coaching um, training for professionals and for caregivers. Mental Health Foundation, so this is Del Adele LaFrance, the co one of the co-developers of EFFT. This is her website. She does advanced EFFT training um, specific to eating disorder. She does some work also around how to therapeutically, um, and or sorry, advanced training on how to do emotion blocks and process emotion blocks. She'll also do training, advanced training through the use of chair work. And then th this source here is specific to Emotion Focused Family Therapy website. I won't go through the rest of the sources. You'll see some book recommendations. There are some book recommendations. There's some manuals uh, as well as books about eating disorders that are helpful for social workers and also uh, helpful for directing family members and supporting family members, giving them some materials to um, to read about eating disorders, to read about support, to, to, to read in that area. And that's the end. Thank you for listening. And again, happy Social Work Month and happy International Women's Day. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rick, for this excellent presentation. I know I certainly learned so much. It was wonderful. Uh, so we have now arrived at our Q&A period, and we'll do our best to get through the questions. However, thank you for your understanding if we're not able to get to yours. Our first question is, um, just looking back at the... Um, the social media piece, uh, Rick, someone had a question uh, around in terms of the social media use, the increase in social media use amongst kids and teens, are you seeing this as having um, an increased impact on the eating disorder behavior? 100%. Um, there are actually Facebook groups um, created for um, help for actually supporting eating disorders. So Pro Anna would actually be one of those sites. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, there are sites that actually promote eating disorder behaviors and pa we have patients who have followed those sites. Uh, we're also seeing the use of Instagram specifically um, as being one of the social media to platforms where individuals with eating disorders use it to compare themselves, whether it's through friends or people they know, because of the amount of follows and likes that can be received. Um, there's a lot of body comparisons happening with, with, uh, with social media. Mm -hmm. and, and this question kind of dovetails off of that one, uh, Rick, in terms of uh, how do we educate our loved ones around some of this, but also, um, what are some cues what we can look at in terms of when do we know if dieting and exercising has crossed over into an issue that needs treatment? Mm -hmm. um, health, what we often tell patients, I mean, it is very specific. Um, we certainly know that people who uh, may exercise, um, so a healthy way of exercising would be like an hour a day or so. Uh, anything more than that can be seen as um, more um, impactful, but we have to also consider patient, people who may be triathletes or people who might be um, marathon runners. Just because we have pe people in that who have those interests doesn't specifically mean that it's an eating disorder. So what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at there is somebody who um, would exercise more than an hour a day, but are more restrictive. So if they're not eating regular meals, if they're not fueling their body enough, if, if you have someone who's maybe eating a slice of toast in the morning and maybe an apple at supper and they're exercising for two hours, we know that that doesn't follow normal eating patterns or follow Canada's food guide. So really some of it is using your own judgment in knowing what would be an appropriate amount of food to put in the body to fuel the amount of activity. Right. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, someone else had a question around uh, best strategies for working with clients who disclose they are binge eating uh, due to a trauma they may have experienced, such as leaving an unhealthy uh, or bad relationship. 
Mm -hmm. So coping strategies would, would be the validation using the valid using validation and using the validation of the behavior i can understand that you um would want to binge because it might be difficult to process some of these emotions and that's very comforting for you so being able to validate the behavior of why it's happening and then going specifically into the emotion what is the emotion that's being soothed soothed there so are they soothing the emotion of hurt are they soothing the, soothing the emotion of anger? What is the being able to label and identify the emotion and then specifically bringing that into the context of why, why they might feel um, or feel that need to binge? Mm -hmm. So specifically going into validating the emotion of why the behavior or what the behavior might be helping with. Because it is about the maladaptive coping um, of the binging and there is an emotion underneath and the emo and coaching and or not coaching sorry validating that emotion would be helpful mm -hmm. perfect thank you uh, we still have time some more questions keep them coming in um, another question we have is around uh, specifically around the caregiver role and how does this approach uh, work with someone who may not have that that caregiver in their life or someone who can take on that caregiver role yeah. So we cert we have seen family uh, or sorry, patients in eating disorder uh, areas of work who don't have family members or don't have caregivers, specifically parents. So most often somebody ha does have a friend who uh, provides care to them or even, um, you know, who loves them. So being able to work with families and being creative in what family means, like family doesn't necessarily, as we know, as social workers, doesn't necessarily mean a family member or a parent you know it could certainly be an aunt and uncle a grandparent or it could be a best friend really being able to look at um, the broad definition of family and hopefully find and lay and identify somebody who can provide that support to them if they don't have anybody then it would uh, it, it, it is part of our role as social workers to still be able to offer that validation. Unfortunately, we may not um, be providing meal support if you don't work in the area of eating disorders. Um, we don't, you know, you may not be doing the meal support. So we would need a family member to be able to learn those skills to, to, do, the, to, to do the behavior coaching. But as social workers um, or, you know, as social workers, we can still do, do the emotion coaching. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, another question is around, uh, are you seeing a difference uh, between how eating disorder behaviors impact males versus uh, females, for example? We are seeing a difference. What is being seen in the area of eating disorders is a lot of men, at most often our patient is females or people who uh, identify as non-binary. People who identify as a male, we typically don't see a lot of those in treatment. We have had some, um, but a lot of times what's being seen in the field and what research is telling us is that um, males typically have more disordered eating, but may not fit the definition of an eating disorder or the diagnostic criteria of an eating disorder. So they may fit more what we call OSFED, other specified feeding and eating disorders, and may not necessarily fit criteria for anorexia or bulimia nervosa. So I, I feel like I'm given a broad answer, but what is being seen is they typically don't end up in eating disorder treatment, um, but we are seeing some more come forward in small amounts. Uh, and then you often see people who continue the behaviors that may be referred, but are being treated by their GPs as opposed to treating, being treated by an eating disorder program. Mm -hmm. okay. And there is a lot of consultation happening with um, GPs. So we are consulting quite regularly and we are seeing some of the patients um, being male, but they typically don't, not typically, but often don't reach our programming. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, the actual program, uh, what is the general age range of, of clients who access the eating disorder program? Um, well, I work with the eating disorder inpatient program. Our age is 18 plus, but there is the adolescent medicine program for patients under the age of 18. Um, the HOPE program also has a mandate um, of working with adolescents and working with adults. 
Um, in the inpatient program, we typically see people, patients in their 20s and 30s, but we often have also seen patients um, who are um, 18, 19, and even in their 40s, 50s. But the generic, the, the general uh, age group would be within uh, 20s and 30s. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, typically, how long does the intervention treatment take? Good question. Um, the intervention typically takes um, a while. Uh, the inpatient eating disorder program that I work with, the adult, the adult program, um, our program is anywhere from seven to nine weeks. But the, that doesn't mean that when a patient is discharged that their eating disorder is no longer existing. It means they've challenged and received treatment, but there's an ongoing process. And then they would likely be transitioning to the intensive outpatient um, eating disorder program, which is the HOPE program. And then that process is a year. Um, that their program is for up to a year. So it's not uncommon for someone's treatment and intervention to be that length of time. Uh, okay. Very much like any mental health issue, um, it isn't sometimes just corrected or fixed or changed in a short amount of time. It is more of a lifelong process. And not saying that everyone becomes very, still continues to be very ill with an eating disorder, but it's still, they still may be challenged with eating, with challenging eating disorder thoughts um, for a, a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so if, if someone had a, cl a client that needed a referral to your program, how would they do that? The referral uh, can come from, uh, someone can self-refer, they can also be referred by a social worker. There's a part of an, you'll find um, on the Eastern Health intranet, if you typed, in, or not intranet, sorry, Eastern Health website, if you typed in eating disorder referral, you should get the referral to come up. Um, if not, I think if you Googled it, you'd probably find it pretty quick. It is very accessible. Um, at the end, I'll show my contact information. So if anybody has any difficulty finding it, then I certainly can offer some uh, help here. Um, the referral will go directly to the intake coordinator. GPs generally know what the referral process is, uh, but it, yeah, it's, it's, and, and it goes through our intake coordinator who then triages uh, the referral. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, another question uh, that we've had come in is in terms of uh, for trans and non-binary folk availing of services, is there an additional or specialized support considering how their eating disorder may be intertwined with gender dysphoria? Yeah, absolutely. So we've all received some training in that area of work and being able to support people in the trans, non-binary, um, with that identification. Um, we don't, I mean, the programming is the same, but the processing of an emotions could certainly be delving into the feelings associated with um, gender sexuality. And then that would be done on an individual basis in the therapy programs. So, mm -hmm. so best practice for eating disorder treatment is mm -hmm. a, a combination of individual and group based therapy. Okay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about, you know, in terms of validating anger and silence. Um, so if you're going through that process and the client still doesn't want to talk, uh, what are some things to do there? Yes, at the bottom of the slide there, you'll see, just let me flick back. I'm not going to flick on the slide. I'm just going to look at my note here. But, uh, or no, I think I can go back. Um, Annette, are you able to do that there, or what yeah, can I do? Yeah, I'll do that, and you can yeah. keep going. Okay. Yeah. So on the bottom of the slide there for silence, you will see, um, you will see, it's the next one over. Yeah. So you'll see meeting the needs. So once you validate silence um, and, and you validate that underlying emotion or you take a guess at it, because remember the statement that we would be using or would be helpful to use would be I'm going out on a limb here or I'm wondering if. And then if they still stay silent, then you could meeting, meet the need there because uh, maybe what they need is some time away or they need some space. 
So even saying, I, I can imagine what you need is space. I can imagine what you need is time. Or for no pressure, I'm going to be in the living room. Or I'm, you know, I'll be available. You can call me later if you need me. I'm going to be here no matter what. So you're still giving them the message that I respect your boundary. And I'm also not stepping away from you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Because sometimes people will still not talk and, and, and that's okay. It's being able to provide that safe place to continue uh, when they're ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, wonderful. I just did a scan through the I'm not seeing any more uh, questions. There's certainly uh, uh, some comments there um, as well. Um, so uh, I guess on that note, uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, we're almost at the top of the, uh, the end of the presentation. Uh, so I do want to take this opportunity to thank Rick for this truly stellar presentation and for sharing uh, your knowledge, experience, and expertise with us today. You covered a lot of important information, and we hope that this session has provided you know, participants with new knowledge and information that you can integrate into your social work practice. Rick, I just want to say your work certainly in the area of eating disorders is vitally important and essential, and your passion for and pride in this work is inspirational. So I want to thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to facilitate this continuing professional education webinar uh, for us in celebration of Social Work Month. It's also great social work promotion, so thank you so much for that. Uh, the, sorry, go ahead. No, I said you're welcome, and I hope that these tools and skills are helpful for uh, each and every one of you. Yes, and uh, the resources are available. The PDF of the PowerPoint presentation is available in the resource section of the platform, along with uh, some wonderful resources that Rick has provided. All those PDFs are there. So members may claim 1.5 uh, CPE credits under the required category of workshop uh, for attending this webinar today as per the NLCSW CPE policy. We also ask that you complete the evaluation form that will appear on your screen. Your feedback is always greatly appreciated and helps us plan uh, CE events throughout the year. So on that note, I wanna say thanks again, everyone. Uh, thank you to Rick. I hope everyone uh, is able to enjoy the rest of their day and stay safe, everyone.